So I'll be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave Welcome to those of you who are able to join us today during our lung cancer living room. I'm Danielle Hicks, Chief Patient Officer here at GoTo for Lung Cancer. And for those of you who may not be familiar with our living room program, it's a support and education series created specifically with patients and caregivers in mind with the goal of bringing to you live and in real time educational talks from key opinion leaders in the lung cancer community. We know that people watching tonight come from around the globe and consist of patients living with varying types of lung cancer and undergoing varying types of treatment. We want you to know that we at GoTo are here for you. Tonight, we're doing things a little differently and we'll be sharing a rebroadcast of a panel presentation that was given live earlier today from our Voices Advocacy Summit in Washington, D.C. The panel of experts consists of people living with cancer and experts currently working in the field and they will be discussing the patient's vital role in advancing lung cancer research. It will be moderated by GoTo's very own Andrew Kupik, PhD and GoTo's Associate Director of Clinical Research. And our panelists this evening are Joe Patterson, Manager of Public Affairs at Friends of Cancer Research, Jim Pantelis, lung cancer survivor and advocate, Judy Johnson, cancer survivor and advocate, and Elder Rayleigh, co-founder of the Research Advocacy Network. I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to all of our panelists, to all of you watching live or post live, to Penn Media, Onyx and Ash, and the entire GoTo team. And of course, I'd be remiss in not acknowledging our sponsors. Very special thank you to AstraZeneca, Daichi Sankyo, and Merck for their extra support during our special Voices Living Room presentation. And I'd also like to thank the rest of our generous supporters as well. Amgen, Boehringer Ingelheim, Bristol Myers Squibb, Isai Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Janssen Oncology, Marathi Therapeutics, Novartis, Regeneron, Sanofi, and Takeda. Thank you so much, and we hope you enjoy the show. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's panel. Um, you know, one of the big themes of what we're advocating for this, this week is about increased research and funding and support for research. But on this session, I wanted to focus on a more a way for patients to get more directly involved in the research process and how we add the patient voice to research, and specifically the impact of patient advocacy. So I'm joined by a really great panel of advocates and people who work in advocacy to talk about that. And so I'd just like uh, each of you to kind of introduce yourself, your name, and what organization you're from, and then we can get started. So I'll pass it off to you, Jim. Uh, I'm Jim Pantelis. I'm not with an organization, but I do do uh, research advocacy and I work with U of M, NCI, FDA, um, CDMRP, PCORI, and a bunch of others. Uh, <laughs> and VA. I forgot VA, oh, mm -hmm. which is really important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good afternoon, I'm Elder Rayleigh. I'm co-founder of Research Advocacy Network, and we are a group, a virtual network that works across cancers and uh, really works to increase the patient voice in the research dialogue. And we do that through a number of different ways, and I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. Uh, good afternoon, uh, my name is Joe Patterson, uh, Manager of Public Affairs at Friends of Cancer Research. Uh, we're an advocacy organization based here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we work to accelerate policy changes, uh, support groundbreaking science, uh, and deliver new treatments to patients quickly and safely. Much of my role at Friends is focused on the advocacy side. I uh, lead our uh, advocacy education program called ProgressForPatients.org, which since we launched that in 2017, we've educated 700 uh, plus patients. Uh, across diseases and cancer types to not only educate themselves on how to be an effective advocate, but also connecting them with opportunities to uh, add their voice to the process. Hi, everybody. My name is Judy Johnson. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I work as a lung cancer research advocate for an organization called SWAG Cancer Research Network as a volunteer on their lung committee, and I've been doing that for the past six years. I also work with the NCI and some people in private practice to look at their ideas for lung cancer research to see what I think might be helpful for patients or not helpful for patients and then give them that feedback directly. So thanks for letting me be on this panel. I appreciate being here with you all. Yeah, thanks for joining us everyone. You know, I think it's a good kind of 
question to kick it all off. I just, I just think I'd ask the panel, what um, does it mean when we say we're adding the patient voice to research and research advocacy? And how does that differ from the other forms of advocacy that we might be used to hearing about? You can start, Jim. Sure. I'm a lung cancer survivor. And I tend to look at research from the perspective of would I want to be involved in this project? Would I participate if I was qualified? Uh, so I'm the one in the room or looking at a project from the perspective of the patient. My job is to explain why this is attractive or not attractive to patients. My job is to explain, if, if I'm on an IRB, my job is to explain why we're not telling patients enough or where we're missing in, in what we're trying to explain to patients to get them involved. Um, and from a research perspective in, in research design, just calling out those glaring things of, why would anyone want to do this? <laughs> Uh, so I'm looking at things from the opposite perspective of the clinicians. Mm. I also start from the opposite perspective. I start by looking at informed consent instead of protocols, right? A clinician will look at protocols first. I want to look at the informed consent because then I want to go back to the protocol and see if there's anything mm. in the protocol that doesn't match up to what I already know. And if there is, it's a glaring problem. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Well, as I said, I'm from Research Advocacy Network, and we are a group of patient advocates that concentrate on research, but we do it by educating ourselves about scientific topics so that we can do better grant review, mm -hmm. sit on advisory boards and committees, and really discuss the research I'm not a lung cancer survivor. I don't ever pretend to be uh, you. So we developed a, a method of getting ways to find out what the patient experience is really like by listening, by doing surveys and research into patient preferences and how that shared decision making is. Because we've learned through this that doctors and, and uh, researchers respond to numbers and evidence. So we've got to speak from that same voice. And by you participating in a survey, that brings your voice in. We can't all sit at the research table. You know, we can't take 144 people, even though we'd like to. But by listening and staying connected to the community, it's very important for me to be here because we're, we're afforded opportunities. And not only do we want to speak genuinely and represent your voice when we have those opportunities, we want to create more opportunities so more of, of the patient voice can be there too. So um, we also have education programs to prepare you for those opportunities when they come. From a friend's perspective, I think we, so as an organization, we've been around for about 25 years, um, celebrated that anniversary a couple of years ago. But 15 years ago, we realized there was a, there was sort of a missing space in the advocacy, um, in the advocacy world, which was no one was really talking to the FDA about where the patient needed to get involved. Um, so we kind of took that on ourselves, and as I told the panel here, the first time our founder walked in and had a meeting, they kicked her out, they said, what are you doing here? Like, why? Why do we need to talk to you? Like, where do you fit into this process? Um, obviously, things have changed quite a bit since mm -hmm. then, which is fantastic, but there's more work to do. Um, so our, the way we sort of work is we you know, bring all the experts together we can to bring the advocates, bring the FDA, bring clinicians, scientists together to find those solutions for innovations in cancer care. Um, recent work we've done with our working groups with uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology is focused on the first step in the process, which is finding out, making sure everyone who's eligible to be involved in a clinical trial can be involved in a clinical trial. Um, those eligibility requirements, we've been working with ASCA since 2015. We've updated those for uh, HIVs, HIV AIDS status, brain metastases, washout periods, prior therapies, um, and 
FDA has taken on those guidance and put those guidance to industry, and those are now a, now a part of trials. And that came from talking with patients like yourselves about what matters to them, what therapies that affect them, and finding out where where those gaps are in the process. Um, because those eligibility requirements were also not only excluding people from being a part of clinical trials, but those clinical trials weren't representative of the populations that they needed to serve. Um, speaking from the efficacy education, um, our portfolio there, you know, I think our focus is connecting with those advocates with those opportunities across the healthcare spectrum, including industry and FDA. And I'll say, much of the time when we're able to connect those opportunities, the patient voice has been extremely helpful, but there's so much work to do, especially from mm -hmm. an industry uptake perspective, I would say. One, they want to hear from advocates like yourselves, but sometimes they're just not prepared to receive that feedback mm -hmm. in the right way. And that's a lot of what we're sort of working toward is getting to a place where, one, they want to hear the feedback, and two, they know how to receive it and act on it, whether it's protocol development, whether like what Jim's talking about, whether it's um, informed consent forms, adapting that so it's speaking to the advocates themselves. So um, the work that I do as a research advocate with SWAG, I get involved really early on, and this is where the patient voice comes in. So if, if a researcher has an idea for a new clinical trial, it's called a concept, and it's pretty arcane, and it's very science-oriented, and they're really excited, because it's cool science, but you know, my job is to step back and look at it to see, well, well what does this really mean? What's gonna be the outcome and what will have to happen from the time that patient makes a decision to participate or not participate in that trial? Can they even do it? Can they get to and from the cancer center? Can they afford to pay for parking and buy food when they're there? Simple things like that that they might not even think of because that's not their world. So uh, I recently was at a conference and there was a, a guy that I, actually he treated my dad for lung cancer, a radiation oncologist. And one of the patients I talked to before the meeting to get feedback said, well, why don't they have more clinical trials for people with brain meds? And I said, that's a really good question. And what Joe was talking about with these expanded eligibility criteria has helped with that, but there's a long way to go. And so I asked him, I said, how come there aren't any out there? And he said, well, there are a couple. And I thought, that's not very many. A couple is not very many. I said, well, you know, keep thinking about that, all right? So my job is to just keep pushing and build those relationships and try to present the patient perspective because I do talk with patients even though I have not been a lung cancer patient. Thanks. No, thanks very much. Uh, you know, it's just interesting, Jim, you know, as a lung cancer research advocate yourself, can you tell me a bit about how you chose to get involved with research advocacy and what how you got started down that path? Like, were you always had your mindset that you wanted to get involved in research, or how did that come about? I, I think you have a responsibility when you're when you're <clears throat> going through a lung cancer diagnos uh, diagnosis and 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 dealing with your disease. Your primary responsibility is to survive. Mm -hmm. Right. A secondary responsibility is to find out as much information as you can. Um, who's the best at dealing with what you have? Where's the best institution? Um, how do you get information that's not on Google? Um, and, and how do you discern what's real and what's not? I got involved uh, I started off involved as a member of an IRB, an Institutional Review Board at University of Michigan, and this was back in 2006 when we had one person doing lung cancer research in, the, in an institution that was one of the top research institutions in the country. Um, and most of the work that he was doing was in mesothelioma. Hmm. Um, but it got me involved in my institution so I could figure out who the right people were <laughs> that I needed to talk to. Uh, the research that's being done at U of M right now is, is phenomenal, and it's a huge team. Hmm. Um, 
but I, I suspect that's the case in a lot of it, in, in a lot of institutions right now because I, we jokingly say that lung cancer is the cool kid on the block. Finally, we do have kids interested in the research um, because we're coming up with solutions. Hmm. Um, but by getting involved at the local level, I also got invited to participate in NCI and, and at the national level um, because I un understood or I felt comfortable not being silent in a room full of doctors. And I think that that's probably the key. We're not there to create solutions. The patients aren't there to create solutions. We're there to ask questions. Mm -hmm. We're there to ask the questions that maybe are too dumb um, or that nobody else thought of. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, why it, silly questions like if, if, the FDA is saying that, uh, that a three to one trial is as good as a one to one mm. trial for placebos. Why aren't we doing three to one trials? Why are we still hung up? Because we always did it. You know, uh, mm -hmm. We're there to ask questions and to, and to challenge things um, from our perspective. That's how I got involved was by volunteering a lot. Now, I will tell you that a lot of the work that some of us do is paid. Mm -hmm. You get paid to be on IRBs. You get paid to be on the CIRB for NCI or an IRB for, for VA. You get paid to do stuff for CDMRP. You don't get paid much, mm -hmm. honestly. I mean, it, it's, it's probably easy. For me, it gets easier, and it's easier than driving for Uber, but you're not going to get rich, honestly. Um, but the more you get involved, the more you get asked to do stuff, and that's the weird thing. I'm, I'm a co-I on two studies, um, which is a co-investigator, it, and I keep getting asked to participate in management of studies or designs of studies. So that's kind of cool. Yep. Um, the, when, when patients can be involved in the design of studies, that's what I've been trying to find for the last 15 years and, and have only really gotten involved in that in the last three. So you stay alive and more stuff is there. So the primary goal is to stay alive. No, that's such great advice about working with your local opportunities and building your way up in your comfort. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad you shared that. And I, you know, in the same vein, I think, um, Judy, you know, you have an interesting perspective as being both a cancer survivor yourself and a um, caregiver to someone with cancer. So could you tell us a little bit about how your experiences kind of shaped your research advocacy journey? Sure. So 20 years ago, next month, I was a breast cancer patient myself. So I learned about what it's like to go through cancer and coming up with the answers to the millions of questions you have, et cetera. And, and it really, it changed my life in a good way in many ways. One being that I decided to get involved in research advocacy so I could help other people. So I did that for a while in um, breast cancer research. And then I went to work for the cancer center that treated me as a study coordinator because I felt like I could make a difference not being a medical professional in that way. And it, it was very rewarding. And I mainly worked on lung cancer trials because I didn't feel like I could handle emotionally working on breast cancer trials. Mm. So I did that. Um, and then probably about three years into that experience, my father was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And of course, knowing what I knew, it was like, oh no, this is not a good thing. But um, I pretended like it wasn't bad, and he did pretty well for a while, and he didn't make it. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to start working harder on lung cancer research advocacy than breast. We need more help with that. We need more money. We need more advocates. So that's what I did, and um, it has changed my, uh, changed my life because I feel like I'm helping people that really need it more than anything I've ever done. And so that's how I got involved 
with research advocacy. That's so, so great to hear, Judy. And you know, you're definitely right about, you know, we keep talking about how long cancer is underfunded compared to other cancers for research. You know, it's so great the advocacy work we have. And also that we have a lot of organizations, you know, trying to support this work too. I think, um, you know, Joe, you touched a little bit earlier on what Friends does, but I'd love to kind of delve into a little bit more about what Friends does to support specifically research advocacy. I know you mentioned things like progressforpatients.org, but is there anything about that or other programs specifically focused on research advocacy you'd like to share about? Yeah, you know, I think everything <clears throat> that we do, all of our working groups, our panels, our events, we always are including research advocates mm. as a part of that, patient advocates themselves, because we know that that's the most important part of the process, mm. is one, bringing all the stakeholders together, but bringing that most important stakeholder, patient voice, into that process. So um, when we started to work with FDA and industry more along the lines that we were seeing in you know, 2010, a lot of innovations were happening, but, you know, as Jim was mentioning, some of the trial setups just made no sense ethically for these treatments that were coming down the line with no, with completely unmet needs, and we were having placebos for these large trials mm -hmm. in phase three. It just didn't make any sense. So we talked with FDA, we brought our working groups together involving patient advocates, uh, and we got past the breakthrough therapy designation, which allowed for earlier FDA review for treatments with unmet need, and that allowed for us to avoid these large phase three trials in these diseases where treatments were already working. So that was the important piece of the project for us at Friends, and we've continued to work on uh, using that model going forward with everything that we're doing. Um, from a, for Progress for Patients, we started that because we felt like we could offer a service to the advocacy community that they would be able to easily access when they wanted to join those opportunities and get involved, where we would need to have you know, calls with them, they could give it, allow people to take the course, um, learn you know, a primer on the FDA, the drug development process, before they would join a panel or a working group or an IRB, or just have that little bit of knowledge to get them started so that they could ask those hard questions from their experience as an advocate. Um, you know, we know that advocates are the ones that have had the experience with clinical trial with their disease. They've been living with it for who knows how many years, and they've seen everything that you can see as an advocate. And we want to empower them to be able to use that knowledge to inform the research process as best they possibly can. Um, you know, another initiative that we started, uh, which was a partnership with Stand Up to Cancer and the Black Women's Health Imperative, was speaking specifically to black women along the same lines as progress for patients to get them more involved in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one thing that we've seen through that initiative is that, especially among black women, the biggest issue for them getting more involved is trust. Not only trust with uh, medical providers, definitely trust of clinical trial processes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a big barrier that I'm sure, I know advocates in this room feel, but black women felt especially. Um, and when speaking about eligibility criteria, there's a way for them to get more involved, but we just have to make that trust happen. But what needs to happen is that trust needs, that, that ability to trust. Mm. Black women, they want to get involved, they want to take control of their health and their outcomes, but the only way they're going to be able to do that is if industry and academia and FDA is ready to hear that voice mm. in a way that works for them. Mm. So we're working hard to, to do that. Yeah. Okay. Can I just yeah, absolutely. add to that? Uh, Veterans, um, especially minority veterans, are far more likely to participate in, in studies that are con conducted by the VA mm -hmm. than by mm. community hospitals. Uh, why? Because they trust the VA. And the VA is pretty much a stigma-free zone, or we try to make it a stigma-free zone. You go outside of the VA and that trust just drops off dramatically. Mm. So trust is a huge, huge factor. I think that's you know so important a theme, you know, because a lot of communities that are underrepresented in research and I think one of the common themes is that I you know I keep hearing and I see in the research is just approaching these communities in the way that builds trust and actually they want to be approached it and understanding that, not trying to one size fits all approach. So I'm so glad you guys kinda of said that. And 
you know, building on organizations that support, you know, research advocacy too. Elda, I know the uh, Research Advocacy Network does a lot of work in that. Would you mind sharing about your experience and the work your organization does to support research advocacy? Well, Research Advocacy Network is a network of advocates run by advocates. Mm. <laughs> uh, and we specialize in programs that advocates teach advocates. Our programs uh, in the Advocate Institute, which is an online learning management system, uh, to offer curriculum on the basics of research advocacy, how research progresses and what the research method is. We're not trying to become scientists, we're trying to understand how we can make the most impact and make the most of those opportunities. And it's free. It's online, it's free. All it takes is your time and your interest to, to do that. Uh, we also it's offer. Pretty vibrant. Too. It's, it's nice. Right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don't get. Uh, the, we also offer custom classes that are offered through organizations. So if there's a, a group of you that want to learn specifically about re research in lung cancer, uh, there's the Stars program that we work with, and there's also uh, your program. Uh, but. We do custom classes for specific groups because our curriculum is really across cancers. But there's power in that because what we learned in breast cancer, we can apply to lung cancer. And what mistakes were made before, mm. we don't have to make those again, yeah. you know. We, we can learn from each other and really uh, make the most of each minute that we're sitting at the table. We really want to increase the, the, the number of research advocacy, diversify the number of research advocates. It's hard because if you're working full time or you're mm. taking care of grandkids or you know, you don't have time to volunteer. Or if you're in rural Texas, like where I'm from, uh, you don't want to drive 300 miles just to, <laughs> to volunteer. Mm. Uh, I'm not in rural Texas anymore, but. Um, you really, Judy and I both have served on what was used to be called an NCI cooperative groups. Uh, hmm. And it took me probably four, four years, well not four years, but probably two years at least to really understand where I can make the most impact. We want to collapse that time so that when we walk in the door, we're trained advocates and we can know that even sitting in the room makes a difference, but when we speak up, people are going to listen because they respect our knowledge and they respect our perspective. And that we're there to be a partner to research and to advance it for the patient. Can I add on to that real quick? Um, what, what you said out is so important and what Deb Violet said yesterday and what I want to emphasize as well is it's a lot about relationship building. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just can connect with a researcher or, or somebody from industry or another advocate or any of you, I mean, that's so important. You just have to make a connection. Even if you're not an extrovert, you just gotta do it anyway. I'm not, <laughs> I make myself do it, probably not enough, but I try my best to make connections and some of the researchers in the clinical trials group that Elda was talking about, probably would not give me the time of day if I hadn't schmoozed with them. I, I mean, you just have to do it. You have to get to know them, you have to let them get to know you, and that way you're a, not just a talking head, you are a person, you are a cancer survivor, you are somebody that makes a difference and you count, and your opinion counts. So make the connection even if it's uncomfortable. The first time you do it is the hardest. Every time you do it, mm -hmm. again, it gets a little bit easier. No, that's a fantastic point. You know, I think we were talking a lot about, you know, Jim, you shared that you worked your way in IRBs and built your way up to getting on bigger things. You talked about just trying every time to get in. Thinking about the way that patients currently find and kind of fall into research advocacy opportunities, do you think that there is things that we as a community, and by community I mean pretty broadly, you know, sponsors, researchers, patient advocacy organizations could be doing to support and kind of help research advocates kind of find their way in based on what we have now. I'd be interested just to kind of hear anybody's thoughts of the panel who wants to speak to that. I can. Uh, I think that we need to be a little bit more proactive. Hmm. 
Um, the Lung Cancer Alliance w was the organization that put me forward uh, or that wrote my letter of recommendation that got me into PCORI, that got me into uh, the, the CDMRP. And they've written all kinds of letters for me over the years, but mm -hmm. I've always come to them, mm -hmm. right? I, I think that, that as advocacy organizations, we need to, we should be a conduit for people so that people can come up and say what's available. I don't think we do that very well, and I don't think any of the advocacy organizations do. I also don't hear the advocacy organizations initiating the dialogue that says, hey, we've got something, would you consider it? This year, the ambassador program throughout throughout the uh, the PCORI stuff, uh, or sent it out in a mass mailing. Uh, and I thought that was great. It was the first time I'd seen something like that from an advocacy organization. And I think that's really important. Um, because I don't think people really know how to apply. Mm -hmm. And you have to apply for everything. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be invited per se, you have to apply, you have to put yourself forward, you have to put together a resume, we can teach you how to mm -hmm. do that. We can teach you how to, how to request uh, letters of recommendations, we can, we can help you with a whole lot of stuff. Um, Lori's gonna volunteer to do all of that, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> she will. But, but we, need to, we need to be more proactive. Hmm. The other thing that I would say is that I, this is, I, I don't even know if I should mention this, but we put together a, a, a grant proposal. Um, GoTo has, and, and it's in process of consideration. Hmm. But if it comes for, if we get funded, I'm going to need to find about 500 former or current smokers. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna need to train those former and current smokers to take surveys. How do you help with that? Um, there is so much going on. And, and the thing that I would close with is that y'all are gonna go on the hill tomorrow and you're gonna go and you're gonna ask for money. I would beg you to thank everyone that you meet on the Hill because we've gotten so much more money than we had 10 years ago. And, and it's important to start off with a thank you. Yeah. And it's a thank you and we need more support. It's, it's a thank you because I, I sat on an NCIC IRB on two of them for six years. And in that six years, I watched lung cancer specific studies go from being 6% of what we did to being right around 30% of what we did. And that wasn't counting the non-specific lung cancer stuff like solid tumors mm. or, or brain mets. Just specific lung cancer turned out to be 30% of what we were doing. So thank people. We really are getting a lot. We just need a lot more. Yeah. Absolutely. To, uh, to Jim's point about doing more, you know, I feel like that is every day, do more, right? Mm -hmm. When you get to the desk, yeah. do yeah. more. And I think we're striving to do that. You know, one of the big parts of Progress for Patients is we want to educate and then connect with other opportunities that advocates can participate in. So every week we are, you know, pinging our industry partners to say like, hey, like we are continuing to add more people to this database of advocates that are interested. You know, do you have any opportunities you're looking for? And we continue to see more and more opportunities coming through. But, you know, I will say it's probably not as high of an uptick as I would like, and I'm sure we would all like in the advocacy community to see opportunities for people to be involved at any point in the process. You know, I think Industry, and Jim will tell you this too from his experience, and I'm sure Judy will too, that once they find a couple people that they like to talk to and that, you know, get in with, with the researchers and they would like to continue to use them. 
But the most important part of the process is adding those new voices mm -hmm. so that you don't miss things using the same people over and over again. You know, and experience is you know, invaluable in those opportunities, but also adding those new voices who can ask those questions that you might not have been thinking about because you've been looking at this trial protocol for you know, six months or something mm -hmm. is extremely important. And you know, we can always be doing more to find those opportunities where advocates can access the opportunity, they can get to where they need to be to provide their input, and then hopefully they're compensated for the time that they're giving in many different ways to be able to do that for longer periods of time. And reach back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Reach back and bring somebody else up with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. One thing that I'd like to remind all of us is that it's a huge responsibility so that when we're sitting there, be prepared, ask questions, say thank you, but also to take the next step mm -hmm. and really follow up, like Jim was saying. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to bring to the group is that we need to ask the researchers mm -hmm. what they need from us. A lot of the researchers being asked to include a patient advocate, and they'll look at us and say, what is a patient advocate and where do I find one? And uh, we want to be involved in, in grants and research in a meaningful way. We do not want mm -hmm. to be just listed as a patient advocate. We want to be able to have a voice. We have to earn that trust. So when we have that opportunity, make the most of it. And that's why there's organizations like Friends of Cancer Research and Research Advocacy Network to help you be prepared for those or, or those opportunities. I think one of the biggest things that has gone toward really involving patients, especially in lung cancer, in uh, the research as a funding is the CDMRP and being a, a reviewer in PCORI. Uh, it's gotten the massive, more, more of the patient advocates involved in understanding the research. There's also the Specialized Programs of Research Excellence. I've been a part of the Lung Cancer Spore at UT Southwestern in Texas uh, for many years. I sit in on their science meetings. Of course, most of it goes straight over my head, but almost inevitably, they'll turn to me and say, what do you think? You know, is this really important? Will this be important to patients? They're talking about a cell or a, a molecule, you know, mm -hmm. and it's so it's it's our job to sit there and say this is important to patients, or this might be, but you tell me how it will be important. Keep the scientists focused on the endpoint, which is the patient, and get it there as quick as you can. Something that was yeah. said earlier, I. I see you out there, I think, <laughs> um, was, was trying to explain things as if you're explaining them to your mother um, and getting clinicians to do that for patients. Hmm. I, I think that's vital. I used to be, in, I, I spent my entire career in, in big data, IT solutions and things like that. And I used to always tell my people that they had to be able to explain it to their grandmother or they didn't understand it. And getting clinicians to do the same is, is as valuable. If they can't explain it to you, who are they gonna explain it to? The other thing that I would mention is, there are a couple of sources here for training. Mm -hmm. Almost all of your institutions have a patient and family-centered care mm -hmm. or a patient experience um, organization. What they don't have is an ability to train you in research. But if you get involved in the PEC or the, the PFCC and you give them linkages to training, they will use it, right? So spreading the word is as important as anything. You know, it's, it's interesting, this kind of uh, thing, you know, we've heard about the progress of 
including patient voice and research, and definitely that there has been progress made, and there's now resources and training. I'd be interested in, your, in the panel's opinion on what gaps and barriers still remain in achieving real patient centricity research, and in your mind, where could we go from here? I'll start. Mm -hmm. From what I've seen, and this, this is from the perspective of someone who's involved with looking at grant applications with researchers uh, from the patient perspective. So I think it's good that we're doing it, but what isn't good is that many of the very junior researchers who are pure research, they don't have a patient perspective. They're, they're, they're looking at the science and that's okay. And I'll give you an example. When I was being treated, or af after I got treated for breast cancer, I had Taxotere, one dose, that hurt my heels so bad I could not walk on them. And the skin bubbled and fell off my feet. So it was one dose. And I was talking to a researcher who was doing something in breast cancer, and we just were chatting, and I told her that story. And she just stopped dead cold and looked at me like she was speechless. She had no idea. And I said, I'm not telling this to upset you. I'm telling this so you know what we go through. So when you're thinking about this research, think about longer term, what might happen to the patients? What are they gonna experience? Are they gonna be able to walk? You know, I mean, think about what they're gonna have to go through. So make sure that when you're talking to researchers, give them an example. You all have them, I'm sure. So give them an example of what you experienced and why it was so bad and what impact it had on your quality of life and with your family, et cetera. Just make sure that you let them know what it's really like. I think that's especially true if there's a PhD after their name. They don't have that <laughs> contact with yeah. patients. Uh, nothing against them. You know, we like PhDs. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, they don't have that patient contact. And we're, we're a little intimidating to them, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, scientists communicate in a different way. They're not emotionally based like pa patients usually are. They're science-based, they're evidence-based. So there's two approaches, either speak to them like with evidence and data, and then get to the emotional mm -hmm. part, you know? Mm -hmm. Give them in the human's perspective. One of my favorite stories about drug development is a good friend of mine who was in, uh, a breast cancer survivor, uh, was on a clinical trial. She was the only, it was a phase two. And uh, at the end of the trial, she was the only one that was still living. Oh, wow. We were at a scientific conference, which is where a lot of these opportunities happen uh, to talk to researchers. And we were in the exhibit hall, and we walked up to the pharma company and she said, I'm, I've been on the clinical trial for such and such drug, and just wanted to thank you for being part of the trial. Mm -hmm. And they said, wait a minute. They went behind and got one of the scientists that had been the developer of that specific drug. He had never talked to a patient. That should not happen. Mm -hmm. That those scientists should be talking to patients at the very beginning and finding out mm -hmm. what, what the patient needs. But they sat there and talked for an hour. It was just, it was so cool. That's so cool. My first PCORI meeting, uh, I was on a, I was selected to be on, a, on an advisory panel when PCORI started. And PCORI is a different kind of organization. Um, but one of the things that it, you just reminded me of this, but I, those of you that know me know that I touch, know that I hug, know that I love people. Um, and one of the people on the advisory panel that I was on worked for GE. And I just went up and I asked her if I could hug her. I mean, we live in their machines, right? Every three months, then every six months, mm. and then every year, it's their CAT scan. It's, you know, I mean, 
And she told me that she had never met a patient. Hmm. And it's like, my life is dependent on that friggin' machine. Hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry, that's all no, I got. No. <laughs> no, that's great. One of the things that I love about being involved in research is that it gives me a little bit of power. Hmm. It, just a little bit. Um, but because I'm associated with University of Michigan, I can, I can wield some of that power. Hmm. And some of that power is, hey, can I come in and talk to your school of nursing? Can I come in and talk to med students? I mean, we need to get these kids while they're kids. We need to teach them that we're humans, we're not patients. We need to teach them that our aspirations are the same as theirs, and, and, and that they're really blessed to get the education that they're getting. I mean, I, my family has adopted three students every year from the med school, and we feed them. You know, they're not allowed to have beer or wine, but, but they, <laughs> like the, they like the free dinners. Um, and they get to ask us anything that they want. And we've done this for seven years. That's great. That's and we still keep in touch with those kids. But what they don't understand is, you know, when they walk into my house, I'm the first kid in my family that ever went to college. I didn't finish. Um, and I'm hosting a kid who's a third generation MD. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's a different perspective. Yeah. Um, so we get to get pushy. <laughs> if, you, if you're contributing, you get to ask for favors. Yeah. So I'll just conclude the panel with a big thank you Judy, Joe, Elba, Jim, and Jim, is this when I can hug you? I don't know, yes. can I give you a hug now? Uh, okay. oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, just echoing those comments, these pearls of wisdom. Mm -hmm. It's the real world understanding that will drive the real world outcomes and Science is no good unless it's with the patients every step of the way. And uh, encouraging others to join in and to learn and be a part of is what will, what will accelerate all of this and reach those outcomes that we so desire. So it is a, a big thank you for the purpose and the work that you bring to this. I'm grateful that you could join us. Andrew, as always, thank you for guiding a wonderful conversation. And uh, we look forward to gathering again and talking about progress that's being made. So thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Great. So I'll be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only 